I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. I love God. And I like God. He's a nice person. And I recommend him to you. How many of you love God? Can I see your hand? God bless you. A friend of mine texted me yesterday. I'm feeling low. And I wrote back, I said, In your mind, wrap your arms around God and hug him. I was serious. I do that quite often. Put your head on his bosom and say, Father, I treat you so badly. I'm sorry. With the ear of faith, you will hear him say, I forgive you. And I love you. She wrote back. She said, I feel so much better. Yeah. <laughs> Hug God sometimes in your mind. God gave us an imagination for reason. Hug God. Wrap your arms around him. Put your head on his bosom. Say, Father, I love you. I'm happy to see you. Thank you for loving God. Thank you for loving his word. Jesus told the enemy, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. From any other source, your eternal destiny is at risk. If it proceeds from the mouth of God, you're safe. I'm really grateful to God for this tremendous honor he has given me to speak for him and to speak to you. And I hope that the words he gives me will bless you today. Our subject, a piece of cake. What did I say? A piece of cake. Before I get into that, let me welcome those of you watching online, whether it's YouTube or what's the other one, uh, Facebook, or whatever means of connection. Thank you very much. And I mean it when I say, may God bless you. You're worshiping with us, the Houston International Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'm particularly happy to welcome anyone who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. We're always honored by your presence, and may the Lord place his hand of mercy upon your life and never remove it until he ushers you through those pearly gates. I speak to little boys and little girls who are listening to me. I always say they learn much more than we suspect. Thank you for loving God, my little brother, my little sister. May the Lord bless you. Josiah was eight years old when he reigned in Judah. Timothy was a little boy when he understood the scriptures. And so for all little boys and little girls, thank you for watching. Jesus was your age. And he was a good boy. And if he had been a girl, he would have been a good girl. Are you with me? And so God bless the little children. I ask God to bless the leaders of all countries represented by those who are watching. Because of this virus, there are hardships all over the world. There are people right now, Seventh-day Adventists, worshipping under very difficult conditions. They're worshiping under trees, outdoors under the burning sun, in structures that leak and the rain falls and they've got to shelter from the rain. And I've seen those places with my eyes. But they're worshiping God because the condition of the shelter does not affect the love God has for his people. But we pray for them. Whether they're believers or not, they're people suffering right now. There's a prayer I offer every day. I say, Lord, under every heading of human suffering, deliver somebody right now. Whether the person is a believer or not, 
because he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And so I ask God every day, under every heading of human suffering, whether a woman is about to be raped, a child about to be abused, someone about to be kidnapped, somebody about to be shot, every heading of human suffering, just deliver someone, God, just to minimize suffering. The other prayer I offer every day, I try to every day, there are people in prison who are innocent. And I ask God every day, please God, you are God of justice. Bring those people out, please. Because you do not believe in injustice. So I offer those prayers. And by, I'll tell you something, another prayer I offer. I drive a Hyundai. My wife drives a GMC. Every day, I pray for people who are driving Hyundais. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Or GMC cars every day. Now God is listening to me. I said, Father, every person in a Hyundai Amen. and in a GMC, protect them from harm and danger. And if they haven't heard it, take present truth to them every single day. Amen. What car do you drive? A what? A Honda? Begin praying for people who drive in Hondas every single day. That's one way to pray without ceasing. I will tell you this. If you make that commitment... I will pray for people in Hondas because I have a Honda. You will begin to see Hondas all over the place. Amen. I was in Australia driving, and all I saw were Hondas. <laughs> I said, Father, you have a sense of humor. All I saw everywhere, Hondas. And so you always pray. I mean, I don't say, Lord, I come to your name. No, I just say, Father, safety and truth to that person. All right. Enough of that. The week has come to an end, virtually. And I'll be sorry to leave you, but they say all good things must come to an end. But I hope that you will reflect on the words you've heard for the past two weeks, not one, two. Because there's nothing more important to God than His Word. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. This means more to God than anything else. I often tell people, God owes you nothing. But he wants to give you everything. In other words, you and I cannot put God under obligation. God owes you Nothing. But through Christ, he wants to give you, come on, tell me, everything. You know what God is obligated to? His word. Mm -hmm. Not you. But if you're smart, you take this and you put it in here. So when God fulfills this, it's done in you. Somebody say amen. Mm -hmm. The obligation is not to you, it's to his word. When this is in your heart, when God works on his word, it works in you. Amen. What's our subject? A piece of cake. Before I get into it, do three favors for me. Favor number one, please preserve reverence wherever you are. My beloved friends online, because God does not change because we're on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube. God is always holy. You know, when the sun sets this afternoon or this evening, the holy day will pass. The sun does not set on your holiness. Uh, you missed it, my fault. Let me try again. We are to be holy how many days a week? How many hours a day? Yes. So let me say it again. When the sun sets this evening, the holy day ends. Our holiness does not. Now, God is always holy. Seven days a week. Every second of his existence, God is holy. So preserve holiness wherever you are, and God will be pleased. And when God is pleased, as I often say, people are blessed. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. How many of you have done that? I've been begging all week. Anyone? Ah, ah, God bless you. I mean that from my heart. God bless you. Bless your children twice over. Thank you very much. 
And for those of you who have not, you have the last day to pray for this struggling preacher. Please, it is a dangerous thing to stand in a pulpit without spiritual help. You may say something that causes harm rather than does good. So please pray for me. I need it. That request is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. That's what I want. And favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Reason together. Let us pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, a name you always accept. That name stands for perfection. It stands for divinity. It stands for sinless humanity. In the name of Jesus, the name that said, I am the resurrection and the life. In the name of the one who said, it is finished. In the name of the one who said, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. In the name of the one who said, I and my father are one. In his name, Father, I come to you. First, forgive me where I have offended you. Have mercy on me, dear God, as I make my feeble attempt to represent you in this pulpit. Bless my brothers and sisters whom you love so much. Touch them individually, dear God, because our burdens vary from person to person. Father, those watching online, bless them similarly. Bless the countries where they reside. Place upon the minds of the leaders, the presidents, the prime ministers, whoever they are, that righteousness exalteth a nation. Father, put your words in my mouth. For I am weak, but be my strength. Let an angel stand next to me, Father, and fill me with your spirit, that you may be glorified and your people blessed. If someone listening to me has contracted the coronavirus, in the powerful healing name of Jesus, heal that person, dear God. Father, I'm not demanding, I am asking. Heal those persons, I pray. And let that demonstration of mercy bring them to you. Because we love him because he first loved us. A special blessing on all the little boys and girls watching and Father, a sweet blessing on all our guests. Now I commit this service to your glory. But before I close, I pray for all those who are standing in pulpits around the world to speak. As I've asked you to speak through me, speak through them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A piece of cake. Looks like 10 after 12. I'll release you by one. If you drove a car. Standard speed limit, this is 60 miles per hour, from the earth to the moon. It would take you six months to get to the moon. No stops for gas, no bathroom breaks. Uninterrupted driving from the earth to the moon, 60 miles per hour, 100 kilometers per hour, six months. If you drove that same car to the sun, 175 years. Non-stop driving. If you took a plane, it would take maybe 20, 18, 20 years. If you drove to the planet called Pluto in a car, it would take you 5,000 years. If you took a jetliner, 600 years. And this is only a drop in the bucket of this universe. The universe is large. I mean large. The fastest rocket, or I don't know if it's a rocket, but something launched from Earth, was launched in about 206, called New Horizons, traveling at about 36,000 miles per hour, about a million miles a day. It took about nine years to reach Pluto. The universe is huge now. Listen to how it was made. And God said, let there be a firmament. Mm. 
What's this? The word. Let there be a firmament. And the Bible says, and God made the firmament with his word in an instant. The sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. The sun is so large compared to the earth. You can fit the earth into the sun one million times. Genesis 1 verse 14 and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Talk about stars. Our closest star is, if you put aside the sun, because the sun is a star. The closest, leaving aside the sun, is so far. The distance is always un, almost unimaginable. We have to measure by light years. And God did that. He did that. He made the earth and the universe connected to this earth in six days. Now, God could have taken one day. God could have taken one second. You know how angels were made? Let's go to Psalm 148. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, a piece of cake. Psalm 148, reading from verse 1. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Psalm Take some time and read the Psalms. You will find every human emotion expressed in the Psalms. You will identify with who wrote the Psalms. Most were written by David, but other people wrote Psalms. Psalms 148, reading from verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his angels. Praise ye him all his hosts. So we have angels, hosts in verse 2. Verse 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and they were created. In other words, God simply said, angels, come. And the angels appeared. Now he made Adam out of dirt. He did not use any materials for angels. He just called them into existence. This is God. The creator, the active creator is Christ. Creating as the agent of the Father. Are you following me? Let me say that again. Christ created as an agent of the Father. By the way, he's also the Father's agent in salvation. The heavens and the earth... Created by God. Genesis 1.1, my favorite Bible verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When God put Job in his place, in Job 38, God said, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you? You know, sometimes we get up into God's face. And God puts us in our place by Presenting to us a reminder of who he is that is creator. Where were you when I made the heavens and the earth? When I laid the foundation and set the mountains, where were you? The, you know, Job, God asked Job about 80 something questions between Job chapter 38 and 42, I believe it is. He could not answer one. Why is our subject a piece of cake? There is a saying in our society, for those who are watching from a different country, when something is easy, you say it's what? It's a piece of cake. <laughs> the universe was for God. A piece of cake. Because of the power of his word. Let's go now to Genesis 12. A piece of cake. I wish I knew all the countries listening so I could greet you, but uh, God knows exactly who you are. God has allowed me to visit about 51 countries. I can never thank him enough. I have precious friends around the world, precious, precious, for whom I would gladly give my life. Maybe some are watching now. 
By the way, we must be willing to die for one another. As you look for Genesis 12, the Bible says in 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is no joke. This is not symbolic language found in Revelation. This is literal. The love for God brings us to the place that as God gave his life for us, we're willing to give our lives for one another. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1, let me pray. Fathers, I continue, please be with me. Stifle my carnal nature, God, and give freedom to the work of your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, he was not called Abraham then, he became Abraham in chapter 17, verse 5. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Perhaps, in my view, one of the most important passages in all the Bible. Let's read that again. This time, we shall insert the pronoun I. It is understood in some passages. It is written out in others. But we will insert it where it belongs. And I want to stress something for you. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house. Now that's a comprehensive call. Let me digress a bit. That's the way God calls a man or a woman. Leave your country, your kindred, your immediate circle. Now, that doesn't mean a physical leaving. It simply means your surrender to God must be what? Complete. That call for Abraham is the call for every child of Abraham. There are some people who come, but they hold on to something. Mm -mm. When you come to God, you come completely to God. That's the only way God calls. You either answer completely or you leave God alone. Get thee out of thy country. Oh, we're all proud of our countries. I'm from Kenya. I'm from Sweden. I'm from Japan. We're proud of our countries. No matter how long we live in another country, we cook our country's food. And we always talk about back home. Are you following me? It's always back home. Now, God said, get thee out of thy country, leave it. And from thy kindred, grandfather, cousins, in-laws, extended family, and from thy father's house, your immediate family, which serves as the foundation of your self-identity. Leave it. The call is comprehensive. All right. And I will make of thee a great nation, verse 2. And I will bless thee. Now, let's insert an I now. And I will make thy name great. That I isn't written, but it belongs. And I will bless them that bless thee. And I will curse him that curse thee. Amen. Abraham was asked to do one thing. Obey me. Amen. God said, I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. I will curse them that curse thee. I will bless them that bless thee. In this arrangement between you and me, says God, I do the bulk of the work. I require one thing, says God, obey me. When God brought the Israelites out of Egypt, all he wanted was obedience. Obedience is the path you follow to avoid the landmines in life. There are some countries where there's still landmines, maybe uh, Mozambique and other places where they had these internal strifes. You never see a landmine. You step on it and you're finished. This world is a minefield. God says, I have a path. That will no, that allow you to negotiate this mind feel. You will not step on a mind. That path is called my commandments, my law. You step here, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now step there. Don't make any images. Okay, step here. Don't uh, take my name in vain. Step there. Remember the Sabbath day. Step over there. Honor thy father. But sometimes we decide, no, I'll step over here. And boom. Explosion. Problem.
Obedience to God is the path he has cleared through a minefield. The United States Army have experts that clear minefields before the Marines come in. Are you following me? God's law, obedience is the path we follow to avoid the mines in this dangerous world in which we live. God says, all I want from you is obey me and I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. It is I. Working on your behalf. Let's go to chapter 11 and see something interesting. God is a God of drama sometimes. Genesis 11. We just read the call of Abraham and a promise from God to make him a great nation. But let's go to chapter 11. We read verses 30 and 31. Our subject, a piece of cake. 25 after 12. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. She became Sarah in chapter 17, verse 15. And the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. Now, verse 31. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. We are told that Sarah could not have children before we read that God told Abraham, you'll be a father of many nations. Sometimes God sets up what looks like impossible situations for us. That he might have an opportunity to demonstrate his glory. Are you following me? Ah, you're not following me. Remove the Red Sea, we would miss a demonstration of God's power. Are you following me? Remove hunger, we would miss the miracle of a shower of bread six days a week. Forty years. Remove thirst, we would miss water flowing, as the Bible says, from the rock of flint. God often allows obstacles. Some we bring on ourselves, some God allows, some he sends. Why? That they may provide an opportunity for him to demonstrate his power in our lives. And so Sarai could not have children. And yet God brought her and Abraham together. And then God told a husband married to a barren woman, you will be the father of many nations. That man would have to live how? By in the word. You see, this created the universe. Now, if this created the universe, including land animals, trees, Adam and Eve, everything that exists, can this same word create a child in a barren woman? The answer is yes. In other words, Sarai's barrenness is a piece of cake. Are you following me? When compared to the power of God's word, this is a piece of cake. But all I ask, obey me. That's all God ever wants, obey me. If Adam had done that, talk to me now. Would we be in this condition now? No. There are children suffering because they would not obey their parents. And then they bring the problems back to the parents whom they disobeyed. God said, I'll make you a great nation. Abraham's faith buckled. You see, we're made of dirt. Now, that's okay. But we made, now we're descendants of dirt that sinned. Are you following me? So we're born with a nature that does not trust God's word. Mm-hmm. Sin has corrupted the thinking so much that God says, I'm life. The devil is death. And our natural choice is the devil. You didn't hear what I said. Sin has corrupted the mind so much that our natural choices take us towards death. So we drink, we smoke, take drugs, we run around. We overeat, we undereat, 
We engage in high risk behaviors. We're moving towards death. God wants to change that thinking so that we move towards life. And give me a name for life God. What's our subject? A piece of cake. Abraham had a child with a sister. What was her name? Hagar. But follow me closely. Abraham had that child with Hagar when he was physically able to have children. Are you following me? Now, we, we, it, we, we enter the story with the information that Sarai was barren. We had no knowledge that Abraham was impotent. We're not told that. Sarai was barren. He went off with Hagar. Didn't need God's help. Are you following me? That's why Ishmael. Are you not with me? You're with me? All right. Ishmael is the son of works because Abraham got Ishmael with no help from God. I'm, I'm able, I'm fit, I'm strong, I'm, I'm f whatever the word is, I can father a boy. He had a boy. God said, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't want him. I'll wait until you, like your wife, are unable to father a child. Because my word does not change. Now, the problem is doubly difficult. Both the wife can have a child and the husband can't father a child. And God still says, giving you Isaac, come on, what's my title? A piece of cake. Because what's a hardship for you is a piece of cake for me now let's go to Romans chapter 4 let's read from verse 19 Romans 4 reading from verse 19 a piece of cake ah, God is such a powerful God and so humble the humblest person in the universe is God the proudest person is a sinner isn't that something sinners have nothing to be proud of and we're proud God has everything to be proud of he's humble mystery Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 19, let me pray. Father, as I move to the next section, dear God, instruct me, restrain me, Father. Remind me that I need you 100%. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Now what? Dead. Dead. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now we have double death. One death is fine. It's, it's bad enough. We have death squared. He considered not his own body now dead. When he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So we're dealing with death lifelessness hmm? can life come out of lifelessness for God it's what a piece of cake now if anything is impossible for a human being is bringing life out of death how many times have we gone to funerals and there's nothing we can do to raise that person absolutely nothing if you want to see a human being in helplessness watch them at a funeral or at the bedside of someone terminally ill, nothing we can do. Sarai is barren. Abraham is barren. But they had grown in their faith. Somebody say amen. And so we read 19 again. And being not weak in faith. Not weak now, he's strong. He considered not. To consider means to fix your mind on something. The Bible says he did not do that. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old. He did not consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now Abraham had learned, take your mind of what you cannot do and place it on God who can do everything. Because God had told Abraham in Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? You see, Sarai, she laughed in Genesis 18 when God said she'd have a son. She said, shall a child be born unto him that is 100 years old, and shall Sarah that is 90 years old bear? That's Abraham who spoke those words, by the way, in Genesis 17, 17. Sarai laughed 
in chapter 18, verse 13, 12 and 13. Both laughed at God because they could not believe in her infertile state and his sterile, impotent condition, they could have a child. But the word said, I will make thee a father of many nations. Here's how I, I may have told you this before, here's how we must believe God's word. I think I demonstrated it before you, before. What color is this Bible? All right. Do you see black? Yes. If there's a text that says this Bible is white, hmm? even though you see, you must say, yes. Let me say it again. Some of you looked a little politely puzzled. What color do you see with your physical eyes? Black. The eyes are part of the senses. We have five. We use the senses to interact with our society, with our environment. So I hear the horns of the car. I step out of the way. I smell a burning building. I get out. You know, I taste the food. It's not well cooked. I avoid it. So we use our senses to interact with the environment now. But faith is the sense we use to interact with God. You know, Thomas said, except I shall see in his hands, and I use my hand, the print of the nails, and put my finger touch into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Belief cannot be based on what you see and hear. Belief must be based on, thus saith the Lord. And so Sarah laughed at God. Abraham laughed at God. They could not figure, how can a child be born. That's what Abraham said to a man that is about a hundred with a wife who is ninety. How can I pay my bills and I'm on social security? How can I do this? How can I do that? That's the wrong question. The question is, can God solve this problem? The answer is yes. Question number two, are there any conditions? The answer is yes. You give me that single condition, obedience. Let's go back to Romans 4.19. We read down to verse 21. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, read verse 21. And being what? fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform now when the bible says in verse 19 he considered not his body it means he did not fix his gaze on his impotence he did not fix his mind on sarah's infertility because the bible says by beholding come on tell me if all you behold is your weakness Rather than the power of God, you will remain in the quicksand of discouragement. All you're looking at is your weakness. So every day you look at your alcoholism, I can't escape, I can't escape. And as long as that's your focus, but Jesus says, look unto me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. We need to shift our gaze. Because by beholding, we become changed. And so he considered not his own body now dead. He did not consider the deadness of the womb of Sarah. He considered the power of God. When Jehoshaphat was attacked or about to be attacked by three armies, Second Chronicles chapter 20, Jehoshaphat prayed to God. He gathered the Israelites together, or those, the, the citizens of the, the Jewish kingdom of Judah, and he prayed. Here's what he said in verse 12. O oh, our God... Wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. Here's how the verse ends. But our eyes are upon thee. This is how we must live. God gave Abraham dead loins. Sarah, dead womb, Isaac. Yeah. 
Because death cannot get in the way of the fulfillment of God's word. The Bible says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed, because it's the worst. The worst. The condemnation of the law is death. That's what the salvation of Christ delivers us from. Here's death. Unable to prevent the fulfillment of the word of God. My brother, my sister, you have a problem, and I don't know what it is. I don't need to know. God knows. Consider the universe. Is your problem as big as the universe? No. It matters little to me what your problem is. I speak with respect. It is not the size of the universe. Now let's reason together. If God can create the universe with his word, can he with his word solve your drop in the bucket? Now it may look like an ocean to you. It's a drop in the bucket to God. Are you in college? You're about to be asked to leave school because of no tuition. But you're an obedient young man, young lady. You go to God. Father, I have committed my education to your glory. Because your word says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Father, I need tuition because when I graduate as a physical therapist or pharmacist, I want to use that knowledge to point people to Christ. Father, you made the universe. My situation is a drop in the bucket. It's a piece of cake, God. Help me. Put your mind on the power, not on the problem. Because what you behold will change you. The Bible says, this is the spiritual application now. You have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. As verily as God raises the physical dead, he raises the spiritual dead. And raising the spiritual dead is more, is more powerful than raising the physical dead. Because the greatest miracle God can perform is to transform a life. And so I say again, what are you wrestling with? What is the mountain of a problem in your life that God sees as a molehill? In God's eyes, it's an anthill. In your eyes, it is Mount Kilimanjaro. It is Mount Meru. It is Mount Kenya. It is Mount Everest. It is Mount McKinley. In your eyes, but in the eyes of God, it's a grain of sand on the beach of eternity. Give it to God. But remember, God is the God of conditions. He has one. What is it? Obedience. That's the only condition God has. Let me ask you this. Where in your life are you disobedient? Don't tell me. My friends listening online, there is an area in your life where you are willfully, deliberately, intentionally disobedient. God cannot bless disobedience. Because disobedience is disrespect. You see, if the entire universe was made by the word of God, and you disobey God, you say, I distrust your word. If you were... Uh, get on the bus there's a lady sitting next there and there's an empty seat next to her and you sit next to her and she grabs her purse what is she telling you <laughs> are you following me i don't trust you when we doubt god we're telling god i do not trust the word that created heaven and earth is there a greater insult that's why without faith come on tell me it is impossible to please god Let me pray. Father, I haven't got much time left. Give me the right words now to give to those whom you love. In the name of Jesus, I appeal to you. Amen. Jesus says in Luke 18, 27. Go there with me. Luke 18, 27. It's a quarter to one. We have a good time. 
Ellen White says sermons should be cut in half. They'll be more effective. Well, we preachers need a lot of faith to accept that. We just won't follow it. All right. But you pray for us. We'll learn. Luke 18, verse 27. And you've got that, say amen. Luke was a medical doctor, but he was a faithful evangelist. The fact that you have a high-powered position is no excuse for ignoring the gospel. You're a lawyer, make time for God. You're a doctor, make time for God. Jesus was the one who ran the universe. He made time for you. Now you didn't hear me. The universe was made by Christ. It is sustained by Christ, the entire universe, but he finds time for you. What do you mean you can't find time for God? Luke 18, 27. Read it with me if you have the King James Version. The things which are impossible with men, come on, are possible with God. Your child has left the church. Your heart is broken. The people I pray for who have left the church, I group with them. And I pray with determination. I remind God, Father, you said in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. You said that. Stand by your word. You said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, you will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You said that. Stand by your word. There's someone listening to me. Your child has left the church. Your husband has left the church. Your wife has left the church. I was preaching somewhere. And a man came to me and said, pray for my family. My whole family left the church. Usually it's the man who leaves the church. His whole family left God. They were all Adventists. I can see the pain in his eyes, but he's faithful to God. And I encourage him, keep praying. When that rich young, not the rich young, the young boy who said, Father, give me the goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance in riotous living. He went off in a far country. The far does not necessarily mean miles. It may mean condition. Now you're in drugs, alcohol, you're broke, you're prostitute, you're on the street. Your case looks, give me the word, hopeless. Ho you've gone into a far country. GPS can't reach it. And God is watching you. But when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. Ah, someone listening to me needs to say that. I will arise and go to my father. Someone sitting in this building who comes to church physically but mentally is in the world. You need to say, I will arise and go back to my father. And we'll say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. The Bible says, and he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off. Hmm? You don't have to improve yourself before you come to God. When he was yet a great way, cry to God from the gutter where you are. Cry to God with that cigarette hanging from your lips. Cry to God with that Colt 45 in your back pocket. Cry to God with those condoms in your wallet. Cry to God right where you are, in the condition you are, because He alone can get you out. That's His work. His father saw him and had compassion. Mothers, you understand that? Your heart breaks for your children who will not obey you because you see where they're headed and they can't see it. His father saw him and had compassion and ran. The father ran faster than the boy, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But before he could say, make me one of thy hired servants, the father said to servants, bring forth the best robe. 
not one from the Salvation Army. Bring forth the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, not for jewelry, but the ring was the instrument by which you sign documents, you see. He has full authority to manage the father's business. And put shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf. Don't get a skinny cow, get a fat one. And kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this, my son, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. There is a God who's in heaven with a burdened heart. As he watches his son go off in that direction. His daughter. Sometimes his churches. I've spoken in churches that left the organization. Because they think the organization has abandoned the truth. That's not true. So they went out. But when you go out, you're moving in the wrong direction. Because the Bible says, every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So when you leave the church, you're headed in the wrong direction. God cleanses the church by taking hypocrites out, not by taking the good ones out. Are you following me? So when you say the church is Babylon, let me leave, you're headed in the wrong direction. There is no reason for anyone to be lost. Tell you something else and I'll close. A piece of cake. Let me pray. Father, I'm coming to the close. I've made the point you wanted me to make. There is no situation your people have you cannot fix. Now, give me clarity of expression, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The parable of the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25. The shepherd gathers the sheep together. He advised them the sheep from the goats. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand. Matthew 25 verse 34. Listen to the Bible. But let me allow you to find it. Take five seconds and find Matthew 25 verse 4. Five seconds. You have four, three, two, one. Well, I'm a merciful person. I'll give you two more seconds. One, two. You have it now? Matthew 25, reading from verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them, where? On his right hand. Now, in the Bible, the right hand is the hand of power. It's the side of victory. So when Jesus told the disciples, cast your nets on the right side of the ship, they got a lot of fish. When the angel appeared in the temple to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias, he was standing on the right side of the temple. Jesus ascended. Stephen saw him sitting on the right hand of God. Now, and so on the right side is the side of power, victory, overcoming. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand that's where jesus is you see we sit on the right hand in jesus come ye what blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you finish the verse from the foundation of the world now we pause we look at that verse microscopically beautiful truth before adam and eve were made god's plan was if we should sin he would make a way for us to enter his kingdom. Amen. Notice the wording, inherit. You don't give yourself an inheritance. It's an inheritance is something given to you from someone else. In other words, I have something for you. My kingdom, come inherit it, prepared for you. God does not work spontaneously. God works deliberately. Prepared for you. I had you in mind. From the foundation of the world. But in verse 41 or verse 40, the king says to those on his left hand, Depart from me, he cursed. Verse 40, 41. Into everlasting fire, we also have the word prepared. Are you following me? But prepared for whom? The devil and his angels. Now, what does that tell you about God? When it comes to the children of Adam, God's mindset for us is heaven. The fallen angels and Satan, hell. Do you notice that when God arranged hell, you were not in his thinking at all? In other words, hell is not for us. 
But many of us will be gate crashers. You know what a gate crasher is? Someone comes to a wedding uninvited. A, a wedding crasher. A gate crasher. You're not invited, but you come, you've kicked down the door. All those in hell will be gate crashers. All those who enter the pearly gates will have the invitation from Jesus. Whatever difficulty you have, and you have one, as you listen to me, it is not enough to take you to hell unless you refuse God's invitation. Don't go where you're not invited. Go where you're invited. Listen again. Come ye blessed. But the next verse says, for the wicked, depart from me ye cursed. Now who pronounces the blessing in verse 34? Come ye blessed of my father. Then who does the cursing in verse 40, 41? The father's well. We have a blessing. We have a curse. But when 434 says, come ye blessed of my father, what's the foundation of that blessing? Revelation 22, 14, blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the way of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessing is attached to obedience. Let me close the book, almost. I always keep the Bible open as a symbol that I depend on God, not on me. Amen. I closed it once and the Lord punished me in the pulpit. And I don't need that punishment twice. My brothers and my sisters, there's a blessing for obedience. There's a curse for disobedience. Neither one is imposed upon us, we choose it. I asked you a few minutes ago, what are you wrestling with? What's the major problem you have? In the eyes of God, it's a piece of cake. Amen. But he asks you and me, fulfill one condition. You tell me loudly, obey. Will you not fulfill that condition? The very first step in examining what's wrong with my life is to examine your relationship with God. Have I offended God? Never be so proud as to say, no, I haven't sinned. Yes, always examine your life. What have I done to offend God that might have brought this on me? Pray the prayer of David in Psalm 139 verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. I might be doing something unconsciously. Search me and show me. Then let God solve that problem. Amen. Am I saying Christians have problem-free lives? No, I'm saying many of us have problems that are unnecessary. You know, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4.15, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. They're problems we bring on ourselves. The Bible says, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yes, but many of our problems we bring on ourselves. Your parents told you, don't marry that man. You married him. Now you're crying. And all the tears won't get rid of him. Obey God. Obey God. God and let God take care of your massive problem massive in your eyes but for him what is it a piece of cake because with God how many things are possible all things Luke 137 the angel told Mary for with God nothing shall be impossible how many of you believe that can I see your hand hands down Someone seated and online, you have a major problem. You want to commit it to God now. But committing it to God means, Father, I'm willing to fulfill the condition. What is it? Obey. If that applies to you, can I see your hand? A major problem you're dealing with, you want to commit it to God, but there's a condition. Okay, I see your hands. Stand up for me, but don't move. Other than stand. Just stand where you are, if you raise your hand.
If you're online, God sees that you've raised your heart to him. I have a major problem. I want God to take care of it. I am willing to fulfill the condition. That condition is, obey me. Obey this. That's how Jesus lived. This is your blessing. This is your protection. Let me explain what I mean while you stand. God created the universe by the word. 2 Peter 3 verse 5, But this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Hebrews 1 verse 3, Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. The same word that says, let there be, it says, let it continue. The stars follow their courses by the word of God. The sun keeps a proper distance from the earth by the word of God. The moon travels around the earth by the word of God. The word that created is the same word that sustains. Because God wanted the maintenance of creation to be at the same level at which it was made. Now, how does God save? James 1.18, of his own word begat he us with, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. It is the word of God in us that creates that transformation. How did Jesus cast out demons? Matthew 8, 16, he cast out the spirits with his word. How did God commit, uh, perform all these miracles? With his word. How does God forgive? He said to the woman who wiped his feet with, washed his feet with tears and wiped them with her hair, Luke 7, 48, thy sins are forgiven. His word. How does he raise the dead when he comes back? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. With his voice he raises the dead from Abel down to the last person to die. How did he raise Lazarus? Lazarus come forth. He conquers death by his word. How does he get rid of the devil? Get thee behind me. His word. How does he guide you through the difficulties of life? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. And a light unto my How does he settle differences between people? A soft answer, a soft word, turneth away. Right? Everything God does, he does through his word. That's why Christ is the Alpha and the Omega or the A and the Z. Obey the word. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, standing in your holy presence, are those who have honestly said, I have a burden, I have a problem. Father, to them and to me, it is a mountain range. To you, it is a molehill. To them, it is massive, it's difficult. For you, dear God, who made the universe, it's a piece of cake. Their problem is not really that problem. Their problem is a willingness to obey you. Father, in the name of Jesus, dear God, in the name of Jesus, someone equal with you, go to their aid. Help them. First, let your spirit massage their hearts, dear God, so that they yield in submission and with a willingness to obey you. Ah, Father, the path of obedience, of blessing, is obedience. The path of safety is obedience. The path of sanctification is obedience to the power of the Spirit. And Father, while I'm in this prayer, someone needs to make a concrete decision to be baptized. The person has heard the word. The person knows enough to make that decision. Whether listening online or in this building, someone needs to make a decision to be baptized or based on the person's lifestyle to be rebaptized. Your servant Ella White writes in Evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2 God calls for a decided reformation. And when a person is truly reconverted, let that person be rebaptized. And now, Father, I'll make a call. No one has to move, just raising of the hands. If there's someone in this building who will make a decision based on what you've learned and heard and you have known even before these two weeks that you need to be baptized, can I see your right hand?
to someone who make that decision for baptism, just let me see your right hand. I'm also speaking to those online. I can't see your hands, but I'll see it by faith. Anyone will make that decision. Just raise your hand where you are. Baptism or rebaptism, either one. There were 12 disciples rebaptized in Acts chapter 19. Someone who knows that he or she needs to make that decision is a decision God wants. If you're online, we want you to contact the nearest Adventist church. If you're in Houston, come and see us. We'll be here all day and let us know your decision that we can work with you. I see a young son of God in the back. God bless you. Give us your name at the end of the service. Please, when a child expresses an interest in baptism, never discourage the child tell the child good now let's get ready for it with some studies do not ever say no because the child may lose all desire to be baptized after that say yes be excited genuinely and then engage in bible study with that child god bless my young brother god bless you god bless you god bless you god bless you three young brothers god bless you we want your three names at the end of the service come and see me come see the pastor we'll get god bless you God bless you. Jesus was 12. He knew the doctrines he could explain to professors who could not answer him. Childhood status is no reason not to understand truth. Eloise says it is God's desire that children understand righteousness by faith. Anyone else? Any adult who will follow the little child who leads them? I need to make a decision to be baptized and take God seriously. Start all over and with his help get it right anyone else just raise that hand let god see it he sees your heart but raise it let's see that hand okay some people are shy wait is there another hand somewhere where okay i don't see it but if it is god bless you god bless you give us your name at the end of the service please because this is serious don't just slip away. Come to us and say, I raise my hand. Here's my name. Anyone else? By the way, if someone thinks he or she's ready, we have water in the pool for this afternoon. We have water in the pool for this. If you think you're ready, and we'll talk to you first, of course. Because the leaders are there to make those assessments. Anybody else? Let's pray. Father, I made the call. Your spirit must do the convicting. Some people are shy. They'll probably come after the service and say, I did not want to raise my hand, but I want to be baptized. It happens all the time. You'll receive them. For those online who made decisions, let them contact the nearest Seventh-day Adventist church. If they're in Houston, let them come to us. Father, thank you for your word. It created the universe. It sustains the universe. And a God who can make the universe and sustain the universe... Surely he sees our problems as a piece of cake. Let us fulfill the condition which is simple obedience by the power of Christ. Thank you for your word. Bless us. Let us meditate on what we've heard, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say amen, amen and amen.